Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. I'm excited to talk to you. So uh, my name is Eric Adnom. I'm co-founder and CEO of Cell Inc. Uh, we are the first bio ink company in the world. And I'll tell you more about what that means and, and, and the process behind the company. So uh, just the first slide, you know, so looking at the pharmaceutical industry, uh, we're seeing that about eight out of nine drugs fail uh, in quite late stage of the development. Uh, we also see that it takes about seven to 10 years to develop a drug and several billion dollars. Um, I think there's, uh, I think this path towards market for a lot of pharmaceutical companies and for the drugs is, is very long. It's very costly and there's a lot of things that can go wrong, right? So ideally we want to be able to test our pharmaceutical drugs and our new medicines on maybe better models. And when I say that, I'm going to say something crazy, which is, which is, might be the future of medicine. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but if we could maybe remove the use of animals in the development of pharmaceutical drugs, could that possibly be possible? And, and if I said that we want to get to a point where we, where we test uh, new drugs on humans without using humans, would that be possible? And wouldn't that be ideal, right? Uh, so we're also looking at a different industry, looking at the cosmetic industry. Animals have actually been banned uh, for the use of cosmetic products. And that's a great thing. I think that's a very positive thing for the European uh, Union. I think that, that's, a, um, um, that's something that everybody else in the world should follow. But on the other hand, when we develop new cosmetic products, we need to test them on something. And once again, if we could test them on humans without using actual humans, that would be an ideal um, ideal model. So I think the big challenge in the pharmaceutical and the cosmetic industry is that there is a massive need for human tissue, right? So couldn't we just print it, right? We could just print out human tissue and then we can use it to develop new drugs and we could develop new cosmetic products and we would, have, we would be happy all ever after. Well, so that is what Cellink does. So we've developed a 3D bioprinter, which is very cost effective, and the first universal bio ink, which is the ink you put into this printer to start printing human tissue and organs. And the way the process is that it's, it's, it's similar to a 3D printer, right? So you have, you have a model of, of an image of an organ or, or, a, or a tissue that you want to print, and then you simply uh, print it out with the use of human cells and a, a biomaterial. And this biomaterial is what the company's innovation is really behind. So, so we've taken a, a new biomaterial that's been developed at Chalmers University and, and with other industrial partners. Uh, we have taken it to the market and to this new industry called 3D bioprinting. And 3D bioprinting is exactly what it's called. It's, it allows you to print human tissues using a bioprinter. <laughs> right, so in the way the process really works is that for instance, if you want to print a human ear, for instance, you take an MRI scan or an image of a patient's ear and you put it in your computer, you have a 3D model, and then you send that model to the printer. And the printer follows the steps as it did on this image and it, and it actually prints out the 3D structure. Now, this 3D structure also needs to include the human cells, which are essential for being able to actually print tissue. And those cells can either be taken from, uh, from the patient himself or it, can be take, or it can be purchased from cell companies. That's, that's not an issue to get these cells. But the, just imagine the possibilities that this technology actually opens up for. And, and as a company, as a Swedish company here, uh, founded here in Gothenburg, uh, we've been able to get into a lot of new markets and, and we have uh, sales of about five million Swedish crowns already. And the company started this year in January, um, uh, 2016. So, so as a company, we've, we've managed to actually be able to start to print this human tissue and, and we started printing with our uh, collaborative partners and, and, and researchers all over the world. And we have this technology in already 25 countries. Now, uh, this structure in front of you is, is human cartilage and that's what we have in our ears and our noses and our knees. And that's something that's been printed. And uh, if we had more time, I could talk more about the science and actually Hector or our CTO could tell you more about the scientific parts. But the beauty of this is that we successfully print human tissue that's still alive and that can actually be used to test new products. And then also obviously as a vision for the company in the future being able to implant these products and implant these organs and tissues into humans. 
Now that is truly what we believe is the, is the new era of, of medical research. And it brings us to uh, a new opening of industrial applications where we've never been in before. And I think this is something important for both uh, cosmetic companies and pharmaceutical companies to start taking, you know, taking a look at. And many of our partners are actually in those industri industrial sections. So now let's also imagine a concept where you don't just print one tissue, but imagine printing several different tissues. And I'm not sure if anybody's heard of this, but there's a, there is a, um, there's technology called organ on a chip. Organ on a chip, th the way this works is that you have a little device, as you see, with little holes. And those holes are connected with little tubes, right? And channels. Now what we can do is that we can print tiny little organ pieces. And we can print a little heart, we can print a little liver, a piece of cartilage, a lung, a kidney. And then we can place them inside of those little wells. And suddenly you have basically a human system where you can start testing your pharmaceutical drugs and your new medication on. Now that, my friends, is really the future of medicine. And, and uh, as a company, again, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say we produce all our products here in Sweden, in Gothenburg. Uh, and we, uh, uh, we managed to deliver them out to, to research all over the world. And with that, I, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And guys, uh, like us on Facebook. <laughs> oh, yeah, we need those likes. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. I don't know what to say. I, I think it's scary. So, so thank you. <laughs> what I don't understand is if you have a tissue that contains blood vessels, muscle fibers, you know, Tons of different type of cells. Can you, can you, or is it only homogeneous tissue you print? Well, so, so to start with, you want to print homogeneous tissue, right? Because that's the easiest. So cartilage, for instance, is a very yeah. easy tissue. Uh, but we're starting to get into to more of the platform where we can print multiple tissues. And we have, you just simply add more heads to the printer. So one head prints one cell type, another one prints another cell type. And you basically tell, based on the model, how the tissue looks, which cells so should be So can you print a, a well-functioning blood vessel today? In, in another tissue? We could, that's where we are. So we're starting to be able to print that. Wow. Smaller, smaller blood vessels and, and, and um, things. I was thinking about my dog. You can print your own dog food at home. <laughs> <laughs> if you're buying. <laughs> no, I, I think this is amazing research and it's happening here. I think it's cool. Questions? Uh, Anders. Yeah, uh, Anders Lema. This is very fascinating. I, I was wondering about the organ on, on a chip. Um, has that been validated in some way uh, using a known drug uh, whose effect depends on the interaction of many organs and tissues? I, I mean, it's. Uh, I understand that you understand that this is a, a quite an oversimplification because uh, in, in real, li real life it's much more complex. But is there some sort of a validation? of the organs on a chip that are available today? So today, uh, the availability, the simple answer is no. Right, we're working on a lot of institutions worldwide to develop kind of the first usable organ and chip models. Um, in a few years, absolutely, I think that's gonna be something that's gonna be used for commercialization of new pharmaceutical drugs. But uh, yeah, today we're at the step where we need to validate th those processes. And it's gonna take new policies from the FDA, it's gonna take new policies from the CE to ensure that we're actually printing the tissue that we think we're printing and the organs are interacting that the way they should. That's a great question. That's something we keep in mind. Could I ask you one the question as well? Uh, yes, you the can. Ref. So if I were you, I, I would also uh, pitch the argument for, uh, you know, in the future reducing uh, experimental animals. But I, I, I just have to point out that while this is quite a noble intention, um, in some ways, uh, depending on how, how you present it more, to a more general audience, it could actually work against those of us who have, uh, let's say, uh, disease models or interesting indications which you cannot, in which you cannot replace experimental animals in the foreseeable future. Uh, I, I've seen examples of that previously, you know, uh, 
somebody comes up with a new technique that could partly replace some animal experiments, and that's very good. But then those arguments are taken by, you know, in, in the public debate to say that, you know, yet again, you scientists who use animals have not realized uh, the technological advancements. I, I hope you take my comment in a good way. Uh, Absolutely. It's, it could be sometimes, in, in the long run, it could be a bit counterproductive to uh, parts of the scientific community, but I, I fully sympathize with, with what you say and, and, and do. We can talk about it later, but imagine, I was, so imagine if you could print, for instance, and many of our customers do already, printing cancer tumors. So if you take the patient's cancer tumor and you expand it and you print it in a 3D model, which is a realistic model, it should be 3D, right, instead of 2D. And then you print hundreds of thousands of them and you try the new medications or chemicals that could work on that. Wouldn't that be productive for the scientific community? So we see that, you know, I think bioprinting has a real step in the medical community and it's starting to take off. And I think we just need to prepare ourselves for how should the regulation be around it and how it should be validated. So back to your yeah. first question, yeah, I think yeah. it was excellent. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I, I'm just worried yeah. that the public might actually hijack your arguments in a in bad Absolutely. way. No, that's a great question. It was well meant, Anders. It was very well meant. <laughs> Heartwarming. Uh, so it's you and me be, be between them and coffee. Should we, <laughs> should we stop or should we continue? Uh, it's, I got all day. Actually, I don't have all day, but... <laughs> So just one final question then. What's the regulatory authorities? What's their view on what you are doing? So FDA, it's quite early. Um, we, we've started discussions on how to, to ensure that this, again, is, is valid. Uh, there needs to be some certification process on, on how, the, how the tissue should be printed. You know, what are the changes that the cells go through when they're printed through a, through a system? Um, I think those, those stones are being laid, laid down as we go. And we'll probably start seeing some regulations in the next year or two. At least some comments from the FDA. Good. Okay, so time for some caffeine and whatever you want. Um, we reconvene at half past three with the last session, which is about growth. Thank you. Thank you.